Okay, well, good evening, everyone. We're glad to have everyone here tonight. Uh, welcome to the finale of the Comfort My People Israel Conference. And uh, have you enjoyed it so far with last night, those of you that were here, and of course today with uh, Pastor Mark sharing and so on? And uh, I would have to say that this group looks like a very cool group tonight. The dress code is a little bit different than normal, but that's okay. We just all need to be cool under the collar. I just want to talk about very briefly about the, uh, the order of what we're doing tonight. Dr. Fletcher will be sharing a course, and then uh, we'll take a, just a short intermission with music. But we'll stay in our seats uh, while we're setting up for a panel discussion. And uh, there will be certain questions. Uh, everyone will be on the panel that are our guests here, and uh, there will be certain questions directed at them. But then we will open it up to the congregation to ask questions. And I'll talk about the protocol for that. Uh, after we uh, do our offering tonight. Uh, but you're all welcome. If you have certain questions you'd like to ask them, you may want to compile them in your mind now, uh, and you'll be able to step up to the mic, and we'll talk about that later. But to, to start off this evening, is everybody ready? Yeah. This is going to be a good evening. So I'm going to have uh, Pastor Sam Clark open in a word of prayer. Teach you how to be an Episcopalian slash Angleton. I'll say the Lord be with you, and you respond, and also with you. Oh, you all already on board. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Abba Father, in the mighty name of Yeshua, the Mashiach, our wonderful Messiah, our Lord, our Savior, our big brother and friend. Father, we come between the wings of the cherubim to your mercy seat where you reign and you pour out grace and mercy to all of us. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here this weekend. We thank you for Mark and Vicki and Sarah and Art and the whole team here. We thank you, Father, that you have raised up an extraordinary group of people to take your word to a world that needs to hear it. We thank you for Walter and for Didi and pray, pray, Father, that you will anoint him and bless him as he ministers tonight, that he speak your words, Lord, that you will inspire him. And we pray, Father, that you will give us a heart and a mind to understand and take it deep within our spirit, that it will transform us. So bless this time, pour out your spirit upon us, fill us with joy and your shalom, your shalom that passes all understanding. In the mighty name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Have a seat. You know, when we do a conference, whatever conference it may be, and different things that we do where we have speakers, and um, it may be speakers you don't particularly know or can identify with, uh, and we think, um, who is this person? What, what, what do they really have to contribute to this conference or this meeting? <clears throat> but I found out over the years that God moves regardless of what you think or what you do. And he has placed people in the body as it pleases him, according to the good pleasure of his will. And he has given individuals in the church with certain skill levels uh, who are gifts to the body. We always hear about, of course, Holy Spirit as a gift, but so our individual is given as gifts. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So it turns out that some of those gifts happen to be the, the skill level ministry that individuals have to minister to the body. And so, believe it or not, in these days, as we've seen from last night through, through now, uh, the things with, uh, that, that were shared, and believe me, you will need the things that you are going to learn, that you've learned, and that you are, will learn through this evening as well. God is moving, and we have something, and we're, we certainly don't have the, the corner on the market on Hebrew roots in our understanding of, um, of Torah. But we have a little bit of an edge. We're a little bit ahead of the curve in the sense that we can help these different organizations, as Lori Cardo Cardoza Moore's uh, organization, as well as Christians United for Israel and others, to understand the unity between the one new man, basically. The Jews and the Christians are aware of one faith, believe it or not. Uh, that we just don't necessarily agree on who the Mashiach's name is, the Messiah's name, but, uh, but we will. But in the meantime, we will need every talent and skill level in order to communicate to Jews and Christians what the Lord is doing in these last days. So are you ready for that? Dr. Walter Fletcher, 
who uh, is a regional leader, him and his wife, uh, Didi, are pastors over pastors. They minister to the hearts of people and speak into them. God speaks into their life. They are the gift to you tonight. So I would like to welcome Dr. Walter Fletcher. Well, you may be seated. Wow. As I look out here, I see you guys are glutton for punishment. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a joy to be with you and to be a part of the PJT and team and Lori Cadoza and her team. And it's just been fun being here. I said to somebody this morning, do you feel like you're drinking out of a water hydrant, huh? Well, I believe God is retching up, as it were, the frequency of our hearing and that we're discovering that we have stepped into a new season in the earth. I mean, you can say amen to that. And uh, I want to call your attention to uh, several passages our congregation knows that um, even though I may give you several, I go all over the Bible, so that doesn't mean anything at all. So if you'll go with me to Jeremiah 38, I want to start there tonight. This has just been an awesome setting for each and every one of us. How many of you thank God when you come together and you are not only hearing new things, that's certainly good and important, but you're hearing confirming things. How many of you feel like God's confirmed some things to your heart and spirit this weekend, amen? Awesome God. Jeremiah 38, let's look at verse six and following. It says, so they took Jeremiah and they dropped him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the guard's courtyard, lowering Jeremiah with ropes. And there was no water in the cistern or the pit, only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. But abet Melech, a Cushite or Ethiopian, he was the court official, employed in the king's palace, heard Jeremiah had been put in the cistern. And while the king was sitting at the Benjamin gate, Ebek Melech went from the king's palace and spoke to the king, saying, My lord king, these men have been evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have dropped him in the cistern where he will die from hunger because there is no more bread in the city. So the king commanded Ebek Melech the Cushite, saying, Take from here thirty men under your authority and pull Jeremiah the prophet up from the cistern before he dies. So Ibek Melech took the men under his authority and went to the king's palace to a place below the storehouse. And from there he took old rags and worn out clothes and he lowered them by ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Ibek Melech the Cushite cried out to Jeremiah saying, place these old rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. And Jeremiah did so and they pulled him up with the ropes and they lifted him out of the cistern even though he continued to stay in the guard's courtyard. This is a very interesting story, and I believe that it really has everything to do with what you've heard already this week, and as we've considered, uh, we've talked about the, what God is doing in the earth, uh, helping us understand the Gentile believers understand um, replacement theology and how we got here and how this chasm, if you please, began between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. It's very interesting as I was reading this story, Evet Melech, who was a Cushite, an Ethiopian, an African, a Gentile, he recognized the uh, danger that Jeremiah was in, recognized Jeremiah to be not only a holy man, but a Jewish prophet. 
And those who opposed Jeremiah's word actually to his own people, that destruction was coming. He warned them that captivity was coming. And uh, Ibn Melech approached the king asking permission to rescue Jeremiah who was down in the pit, who had sunk down in the mud and surely would die there. And I believe in many ways that uh, uh, this is a very prophetic and a beautiful picture for what God is doing as it were in positioning Gentile believers in this hour to stand with Israel, to stand with their Jewish brethren, to stand with those against those who would seek to destroy them. Are you out there somebody? It's okay, you can talk back to me. And, and so Jeremiah uh, was rescued by Abed Melech. It's very interesting. His Hebrew name means servant of the king. Servant of the king. I'd like you to think about that. And I want us to really apply that to our hearts today as primarily I believe we're speaking to Jewish believers and we welcome those who may be watching this by, via uh, our streaming. But I'm primarily directing this to you and I as Gentile believers as to what our role might be in this new season that we sense that we have stepped into in the earth. And I believe Abek Melech helps us. He is one who is called a servant of the king. How many of you thank God that you've been called to be a servant of the most high God? Amen. I want you to see something though over in Gen uh, Jeremiah 39, the story of Abek Melech doesn't stop with him rescuing Jeremiah. Go over to verse, uh, verse 15 of Jeremiah 39 and it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah when he was confined in the court, uh, the guard's courtyard. Go to Abek Melech the Cushite and say, this is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel says. I am about to fulfill my words for harm and not for good against this city. They will take place before your eyes on that day. But watch this. But I will rescue you on that day. This is the Lord's declaration and you will not be handed over to the men whom you fear. Indeed, I will certainly deliver you so that you do not fall by the sword because you have trusted in me you will keep your life like the spoils of war. This is the Lord's declaration. Amen. I want you to see what a wonderful promise, the cause and effect as it were, when Ebek Melech recognizing God's servant rescued him, this Jewish prophet rescued him from certain death and destruction, risked his life as it were, standing with Jeremiah against those who opposed God's messenger and God's word. And God says, I've got a word for Ebek Melech. Jeremiah wants you to tell him, even as he's rescued you, so I will rescue him in these coming days of captivity and destruction. And I believe that God is calling us, amen. If you're gonna do it, let's do it right, amen. I believe God is speaking the same thing, come on now, to those who are believers in Yeshua, that if we'll stand with his people in this hour, the people of God, Israel, in this hour of their crisis, God says, I'll take note of you, I'll mark you for deliverance and not for destruction, amen? So we're living in this unique hour and I want us to see, and I won't digress because there's just been some incredible unpacking of this understanding of how we got here in replacement theology. And for those of you who may just be joining us, I'll put in just an encapsulated form that over hundreds of years, if not thousands, we've had a theology that has risen up within primarily the Gentile church uh, that primarily says that we now are the uh, purveyors of God's goodness, that somehow uh, Israel has been entirely rejected and therefore God has entirely accepted the Gentile church and we have replaced Israel as Israel and we've become the Israel of God. And uh, if you look at the scriptures today, the saying somewhat goes like this. If you find bad promises, that's for Israel. If you find good promises, that's for the church. Hello? But it's a lie. God has not revealed this in scripture to us. And so what I see today in this awesome hour, there are two things happen simultaneously. Two veils are being removed in this hour. 
one of the veils is being removed from the Gentile believers as to their responsibility to uh, the Israel, the people of God. The veil is being removed from the heart of the true church and her responsibility to stand with Israel. That's what this whole conference is about. Isaiah 40, one and two. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Speak comfortably to her, say if your God. Tell her that her warfare is over and I'm going to give her double for all that she has suffered. Now, please understand, if you look at those two verses carefully, because they come right before the verse where it says, behold, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. God is speaking to someone who apparently is outside, as it were, those who are known as the people of God, Israel. And he's saying, I want you to comfort my people. And I want you to announce good news to her that all that she has suffered, all that she has gone through, that I'm going to give her double, I'm going to uh, uh, remove her, her iniquity, and I'm going to bring blessing back into her life. That's what you're to announce to her. And then we find that famous uh, passage, prepare you the way of the Lord, Isaiah 60 and verse nine. They shall bring your sons from afar. That's God's promise to Israel. Though they had been scattered to the nations, though yes, judgment had come, but it wasn't utter destruction. And God says, you've grown up there. If you remember even Jeremiah's word, we quote it often, Jeremiah 29. I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts of peace, not of evil. Who's God speaking to there? He's speaking to Israel. Israel who found themselves in the captive place, found themselves, come on now, in a, in a, in a, in a Babylon captivity, but God says, hang on. I want you to grow there. I want you to increase there. I want you to raise families there. I want you to pray for the city that you've gone into captivity because if it increases, so will you. If it prospers, so will you. But there's coming a day, God says, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to bring you back to the land. And so we know that God's promises are irrevocable. His purpose for Israel are irrevocable. And you and I just happen to be those who are recipients of grace. Thereby, we have a responsibility to be restorers of hope. This is what this is about. And so we see the one veil coming off the Gentile believers, the church in this day, understanding God's heart and love for Israel, but also we discover another veil is coming off and that veil is coming off of the heart of Israel in this day in order for them that they might receive their Messiah, in order that they might receive the one in which you and I, we believe Yeshua is the Messiah. I have uh, wonderful uh, Jewish friends and I tell them, look, we need to enter into a conversation. You and I believe in the same God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel. The difference is we happen to believe Yeshua's is Messiah has come and is coming. You happen to believe the Messiah will come. We need to have a conversation. And the interesting thing is they have admitted that they've never known a time where bridges are being built to where this conversation can be had. Are you excited about that? So a veil is coming off, even the Jewish community in this hour. And the key I want us to understand that it takes revelation and faith by the Holy Spirit, given by the Holy Spirit to the Jewish people to understand what God is doing in this hour as well. Two veils need to come off and we need the help, both of us, the help of the Holy Spirit, amen. You know, the Bible says in that day, they shall see eye to eye. Hmm? Well, I'll tell you, if we see eye to eye, I know what we'll see. Not you, not me, not them, as it were. We'll see him. We'll see God above us all. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, one of the things that's being discovered for many, and this really is a shock for many in the Jewish community, that Jesus actually was a Jew. Yes, we're laughing, but you'll be surprised how many really are just coming to that discovery because there have been so much anti-Semitic, anti-pogroms uh, and everything that were in the name of Christianity, in the name of Christ done against the Jews that, that they're right now coming uh, to a realization of even the possibility that he was a Jew. Hmm? So this is one of those things as we talk about the veil coming off. And yet I remind you that Jesus said himself in Matthew's gospel that he came for the lost sheep of Israel. 
He was born a Jew. He lived among the Jews. He came as a Jew and announced himself that he had come for the Jewish people. Again, I remind you in Matthew 23, Jesus himself wept over Jerusalem because they didn't realize the hour of their visitation. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have longed to gather you as a hen did her chicks and yet you would not because you didn't recognize the hour of your visitation. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus himself says that you will not see him again until you say the Hebrew words, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai. Did you know Jesus spoke Hebrew? <laughs> These were words he spoke to a Hebrew audience. Hmm? Baruch haba Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then again, as we've already discovered, if you've been a part of this conference, you know that the very root and foundation of what we call the church, that root in its foundation was a Jewish foundation from the beginning. The believers, which actually were a sect among the Jewish community at that time, were Jewish, the foundation was Jewish, the apostles were Jewish, the message was to a Jewish audience. Hello? So veils are coming off. We're beginning to discover something. Even John records in his gospel, uh, or one of the gospel writers, uh, Luke, excuse me, Luke records that even when our Lord, after 40 days of appearing after he had resurrected, that as he ascended, guess what? The two angels came while the other uh, apostles were looking up, watching him going up, saying, ye men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up at him who is going? The same one who went up, you saw him go up, go up in like manner. How did he go up? Well, he went up in a cloud. Yes, he did, but he went up as a Jew in a cloud. And this same Jesus who you saw go up in a cloud, he's coming back in a cloud the same way you're going to see him. He went up as a Jew, he's coming back as a Jew. Hello. And this certainly squares with scripture because the Bible tells us that the very gospel was preached to Abraham and John records in John chapter eight, Jesus, Yeshua saying, your father Abraham was overjoyed that he could see my day and he saw it and rejoiced. Do you know what the crowd said to Yeshua at that moment? What? You've seen Abraham? Why you're not even 50 years old. Now, you'll have to appreciate this really if you have the Septuagint translation of what Jesus said, which had been translated in the Greek New Testament. Jesus said at that moment, he said, even before Abraham was, ego eimi, the Greek word I am. It's the same thing that God said to Moses when Moses said, when they asked me, who have sent me, what shall I say to them? The Septuagint, the Septuagint uh, version says, ego me. Tell them I am. This is what Jesus said. No wonder they picked up stones. They got the import of what he was saying. Hello? We need to understand that Jesus lived in this day among the Jewish community and uh, bore witness uh, in, in among them. And then Shaul, Paul says in Galatians 3, now the scripture saw in advance, say in advance, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and told the good news ahead of time to Abraham saying, hello, all the nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, that's good news. So let me, in the, in, the, in the time that I have, I want to paint from the Old Testament a beautiful picture, I believe, of, of how God is preparing us to understand better what I'd like to call, as we talk about receivers of grace and restorers of hope, this, this romance of redemption. If you go to the book of Ruth, which is a wonderful book and a book that is read in its entirety in one of the uh, Jewish feasts, I believe Shavuot, am I correct in that, Pentecost, that the entire book of Ruth is read as part of the celebration of this Jewish feast, the feast of the Lord. And I like to call it a romance of redemption because I believe it paints for us, it projects for us a picture of what God is doing and saying for you and I today. I don't know if you've ever really thought about the fact that among all the books of the Old Testament, Ruth actually was a Gentile. 
And yet this book is honored and read in its entirety among the Jewish community during the Feast of Shavuot. Hmm. I think that's very interesting. Let's look at the first chapter. We won't read all of this. Woe is me, I'm full of matter. So we'll just read a little, just to give you a little insight into this story. I trust you're familiar with the book of Ruth. Let me start at verse one here. It says, during the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and his two sons uh, he came to there with his two sons to live in the land of Moab for a season, for a while. And the man's name was Elimelech and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they entered the land of Moab and they settled there. And Naomi's husband Elimelech died. And she was left with her two sons. Her two sons took Moabite women as their wives. One was named Ophrah, I mean Ophrah. <laughs> yeah. And the second was named Ruth. And after they had lived in Moab about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left with her two children without her husbands. I think we'll stop right there. I want us to see that in this book, very interesting that the book of Ruth starts, it opens with the story of loss, the story of loss. They had come down, Elimelech had brought his, his bride, had brought Naomi, had brought his two sons down to Moab because there was a famine in their land. And in addition to the famine, Elimelech dies in the land, his sons marry Moabite women, and then the sons die in the land. The book opens with a story of loss, though it's not going to end there. But I want you to see how God sets up a narrative for us. Hmm. It's very interesting, the name of these two boys. Well, first, let me look at Elimelech, Elimelech, Elimelech who's Naomi's husband. His name means, my God is king. How I many of you know that even though he's gone down into a condition of famine, there's famine in the land, he's gone away to get away from the famine in Moab, he can't help but prophesy even in the land of Moab by his very being. You do understand name equals nature in the Hebrew language. And so here is one who in the spite of loss and here famine beginning, in spite of the fact that he's down in this place, this land of Moab, he's still bearing witness, come on now, to the true and living God. My God is king. His sons are very interesting too in their name, meaning Hebrew for Malon means weak, sickly, or afflicted. Kilion means wasting away. Now we know something's wrong uh, very decidedly, in these very names, we see a picture of those who had been brought down to Moab, and I'll talk to you about that in just a moment, that here in their very lives and very witness, they become sick, they become afflicted. In their weakness, one dies and the other wastes away. We know something's wrong because they had left their land, Jerusalem, they had left the land of peace, they left the city of peace and gone down to Moab. Are you with me, somebody? Moab really is a picture of compromise. You remember Moab was a, was a result of, of Lot and his, his daughters after they had fled from uh, 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 Sodom. Hmm? And we find this ancestral relationship and as a result of that, the Moabites come into being. A land of mixture, a land of compromise. He'd gone down. It speaks of spiritual declension. I want to say to you tonight, be careful when you try to help God out when you find yourself in a crisis. You might find yourself leaving the place of peace and going down into a place of compromise. And if you stay there too long, you might find that though famine wasn't a good situation, but the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Amen? And so we find that there was death even in the midst of loss. 
Bethlehem means house of bread. Judah means praise. So here are these who, the husbands, all the husbands die in the land of Moab. Now there's only these two daughters who had purposed to stay with Naomi. Naomi had heard that God was visiting his people and giving them bread. Naomi had purposed in her heart, in spite of the crisis that she was in, in spite of the losses that, she, that had been incurred, when she heard that there was a visitation on, that God was visiting his people and giving them bread, she decided that she would arise and go back to the city of Bethlehem. Her daughter said, we'll go with you. I want to tell you, beloved, this is an hour where God is visiting his house and giving them bread. It is an hour where people are looking around saying, where can we go? Where, where is there a possibility? Well, I want to tell you the possibility is we return to the book. We return to the word of God. We return to the Torah. Come on now. God is visiting his people and giving them bread in this hour. Amen. But I want to tell you, it's a decision. You can hear all day long how God is visiting his people and giving them bread and never make a move. It's rather interesting in the very names of these daughters, they're instructive for us. The Bible tells us that Orpah, Orpa, her Hebrew name means back of the neck. And how many of you know that it really was prophetic of what she did, even though she said to Naomi, I'm going to go with you. She ultimately, she in the end, turned her back on Naomi and went back to her people and followed after her idols and her gods. I want to say to you, you can't go back. Because you see, Ruth's name means friend. Ruth's name means clinging one. And actually, this uh, Ruth's words to Naomi, even though Naomi said, why don't you go back? I, I, I won't have any more sons. You can't wait long enough for me to have sons. Even if I have them today, are you going to wait long enough for them to, to, to grow up as, as young men? Go back. But Ruth said this, and we often quote it as part of a wedding ceremony, but it's not a wedding ceremony for Ruth. It's actually uh, Ruth's declaration to Naomi, her mother-in-law, who had become her friend. Because you see, Naomi had shared with her and had witnessed to Ruth uh, concerning the God of Israel, Ruth the Moabitess. And she told her about this God. She told her, no doubt, about the miracle working God. She told her, no doubt, about the signs and wonders. She told her, no doubt, about the God who had parted the Red Sea and how they got over. Hallelujah. And no matter how bad it was, Naomi didn't forget her God and shared with Ruth who this God was. And so when the time of visitation came for Naomi to go back, Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee. For where you go, that's where I'm going. And where you lodge, that's where I'm going to lodge. And where you lie down, that's where I'm going to lie down. And guess what? Your God's going to be my God. And where you die, that's where I'm going to die. You see, we need to understand in this hour that God is looking for those who will not only, you know, it's good to have uh, uh, friends, but a lot of them often are bad weather friends. What's really going to identify as, a friend, uh, or as friends of God in this hour is not what we've said with our lips, but what we've done in action. Jesus said, as a matter of fact, on that day when he shepherd, separates the goats and the sheep, on that day, even those who didn't think they did very much, even those who gave a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord will not lose their reward. This thing is very practical. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, come on now, you visited me. This is a very practical thing. And who was he talking about? Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren. My brethren, did you hear it? Who is he talking about here? He's talking about his brother in Israel. Come on now. He's looking down, down at the end of the time. I believe he was looking down at the end of time, looking at our time. And said, what are you going to do? Are you going to be those who are going to turn their back and go back? There are a lot of people going back. If they're not going back, they're looking back. You see, Ruth believed in the spite of her loss, in spite of crisis, in spite of the trouble that was all around her and brewing. Come on now. She believed that her future was bigger than her past. And this is what I'm saying, beloved. We've got to be those who have that kind of faith in this hour. Amen? 
Listen to the words of Shaul. Paul, he said, for everything that was gained to me, I've considered it but loss, say loss, for the excellency of winning Messiah. More than that, I also consider everything to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and considered them filth, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, come on now, but one that is through faith in Jesus Messiah, the righteousness from God based on faith. Not that I've already reached the goal or I'm already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I've also been taken hold of by Christ. Brothers, I do not consider myself having apprehended, well, what did you, Paul? This one thing I do, come on now, isn't this what Ruth did? Forgetting what's behind, reaching forth into what's ahead, pressing toward the mark of the high call of God, come on now. You see, God's looking for a people in this hour when the going gets tough, the tough do get going, but they don't go in the right direction, come on now. We're gonna, we're gonna go after the God of Israel, amen? It's the true and the living God, hallelujah. Well, I wanted you to see that Ruth began to seek, but not only did she seek, if you go to chapter two, uh, you'll find that Ruth began to serve, say serve. You see, I believe that if we're going to understand our debt to Israel, we're not only called, come on now, to be receivers of grace, we're restorers of hope that we'll seek ways in which we can serve. Ruth didn't just come into the land and sit down and say, well, I'm blessed God, I'm out of Moab, I've got out of that one, come on now. She began to serve because Naomi, by the way, because her heart was broken and wounded, she changed her name from Naomi, which means pleasant, to, Na uh, to Mara, which means bitter. She projected her, her, her condition, as many people do, her losses, she projected them on God. But how many you know God didn't do it? How do you know there was a blessing in mind for Naomi? Ruth came into the land with an attitude of serving. And I want you to know that in this hour, God is looking for those who will serve his people. Ruth befriended. She became not only the daughter-in-law of Naomi, she became a servant, come on now, to this daughter of Israel. Are you hearing me, somebody? And so she looked for a field in which she could begin to labor in. And it just happened as she labored, she, as she landed in a field, the Bible says it, it just happened. A happy stands for her. She landed in the field of Boaz. And you know, because of her attitude in serving, Boaz heard about her before he actually knew who she was. Oh my goodness. I said, Boaz took note of her because of her serving. I want to tell you, beloved, that the eye of the Lord run to and fro on all the earth in this hour, looking for those whose hearts are perfect toward him. He's looking for those with servants' hearts, amen? If you want to get in on the blessings of Israel, come on now. If you want to get in on the promises of God, you begin to serve, come on now, with an eye unto him. And even as she served with an eye unto him, his eye was toward her. Hallelujah. It doesn't God say in Psalm 32, 8, I will guide thee with my eye upon thee. You see, when little old beloved, when Ruth made the decision that she would go all the way with Naomi, she would embrace Naomi's God. God said, you go all the way with me, I'm going all the way with you. And God's eye was upon her and God's eye guided her and she began to serve in the field. Boaz took note of her and said, who is this maiden? Well, they said, it's Ruth the Moabitess. She's the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Naomi who's lost her husband. Naomi who's lost her, her kin in Moab. And Boaz began to take notice. And then he said to her, hey, come over here. You know, have some of the, uh, the bread and the wine. Can't go into all that. So that's a beautiful picture there. But this is what he said to her. He said, uh, do not go into another field, but stay close by those who are in my field. And he even instructed those who were in her field, the other laborers in his field and workers, he said, now, when she goes forth, I don't want anybody to touch her. 
I don't want her to, I, I, I'm, I'm protecting her. Come on now, because she's come into the field of Boaz. Oh, I'd love to unpack this for you. I'm watching over her in every way. I'm going to protect you because you're in my field. I'm going to watch over you to see that even hands full are dropped on purpose so that everything you need is provided. Hello, somebody. I'm talking about being restorers of hope. You see, when you set your heart on the things of God, God sets his heart on you and the things, come on now, does he not say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things are going to be added? Boy, I'm getting away from my notes. Y'all making me preach here tonight. Making me work here a little bit. But I'm going to bless those who bless you. And so Boaz takes note of Ruth. So Ruth is serving. I want you to understand again in chapter 3, not only was Ruth in chapter 1, she was seeking. In chapter 2, she was serving. But how many of you know, in chapter 3, she was sought after. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, you see, uh, the owner of the field took note of her. Boaz happened to be the kinsman redeemer. And you understand that he was the one, in fact, who by law, who could redeem the land uh, that belonged to his kinsman, uh, Elimelech. And uh, he not only took note of uh, Ruth, the Moabitess, but he began to seek after her. And I'd love to unpack all of this, but at Ruth 3.3, 3, Naomi begins to kind of watch, you know, these two, their eyes, you know, one another in the field and kind of knew something was going on there. And so she says to Ruth, look, uh, Boaz, he's a, he's a kinsman redeemer. He's one of your cousins, all right? And, and I think he really likes you. So this is what I want you to do. Uh, Ruth 3.3, 3, wash, put on perfume oil, and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. Ah, oh, what wisdom from a good Jewish woman, hallelujah. The way to a man's heart, obviously, is don't bother him. But here I want to see, there's a beautiful picture here. I believe what, what really prophetically God would say even to us. Ruth who was seeking, Ruth who was serving, Ruth suddenly became sought after. And Naomi says, wash, prepare yourself, change your garments, anoint yourself with oil and perfume. Get ready and get down to the threshing floor. Come on now. Take, a, take, take, take notice of where he lays down to take his nap when he's through eating. Oh, I'd love to just, just unpack all of that for you. But how many of you know that God is saying to his people, this is an hour you got to get ready. This is an hour to clean up your act. Come on now. Holiness is still in style. Come on now. Get ready. Change your garments. Prepare your heart. Yeshua tells the story of those who were ready in the, in the midnight hour when the cry comes. They had extra oil. Say extra oil. God's looking for those who are making a little extra pains. It, it, oh, beloved. If you're going to be restorers of hope, it's going to cost you something in this hour. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Come on now. Truth is costly. If you want the extra oil in your life, if you want the anointing, if you want the Ruha HaKadosh in your life, it will cost you something in this hour. Get down to the threshing floor. Hallelujah. But I love what she says to him. Now, now, now don't, don't disturb him. Do not approach him. Watch this. Until he is satisfied. Does that do anything for you? Let me, let me just help you tonight. This is an hour it can't be all about you. Don't disturb him until he's satisfied. You see, we want to know what do we get in this hour. We want to know what do we do if we'll follow him in this hour. Oh, he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. Don't misunderstand me. But I want to tell you, beloved, if you want to know what it is that God's doing in this hour and bringing Jew and Gentile believers together, he is calling forth a bride. He's calling forth an army. Come on now. He's looking for those, come on now, who won't disturb till he's satisfied. Hmm. Hallelujah. Getting any of this tonight? Chapter 4, we see not only was Ruth sought after, but how many of you know she was satisfied? Hmm? 
say satisfied. In chapter 4, we find ultimately the goal for Ruth, listen, was not merely to be in the field, to have hands full dropped on purpose in her life. The ultimate goal for Ruth was to be married to the man of the field. Hello. You see, we, we've, we've settled for much too low. We're, 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 we're satisfied. Come on now. Ruth had come up from a place of compromise. She'd come up from a place of law. She'd come up from a place of death. It wasn't just that I'm going there to survive. Come on now. I'm going there because I'm going to be fully satisfied by being married to the man of the field. In case you don't know it, he that's joined to the Lord is one with him. Hmm? And so we find Ruth who was seeking. Ruth began serving. Ruth became satisfied. Hmm? She was sought after by the man of the field. She was redeemed by Boaz. She was purchased. Come on now. I don't have much time to really go into all of this. This is such a beautiful story. I commend it to you. But what I want you to see that out of this union, out of this union of Ruth and Boaz came Obed. Who was Obed? Well, we actually read it here in the text. I don't even have to, to enlighten you very much on it. It says this in, uh, uh, in uh, chapter 4 of Ruth. Look down in verse 21 of chapter 4. Salmon fathered Boaz, who fathered Obed, and Obed huh, fathered Jesse, who fathered David. I mean, you see something there. What do we have here? Obed, whose son is Jesse. Jesse, whose son is David, who is David. David is the one through whom all, whom an eternal and earthly throne is given. Hmm? Through David, Messiah would come. It's very interesting. Those of you who are careful students, if you take Matthew's gospel, which is a gospel which has been attested to, not having been translated into Hebrew, or, uh, or, uh, but actually written in Hebrew. If Matthew wrote it in Hebrew, who do you think the audience he was writing to was? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so we read in Matthew's gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 5 and 6, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Who is Rahab? She's a Gentile. Who is Rahab? She's a businesswoman. <laughs> Yeah, she had a ministry to the brethren on the wall of Jericho. Are you with me? Boaz, Salmon was father, fathered Boaz by Rahab, the Gentile. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Who was Ruth? Moabitess. Hmm? Incidentally, Ruth, a Moabitess, if you understand, God had pronounced a curse on the Moabite uh, tribe, he said, for 10 generations. They would not enter into the presence of the Lord. Would you dare to believe with me that Ruth was of the 10th generation? Yeah, I knew you knew that. I know Pastor Mark's already unpacked this so I could share this without any, any difficulty. Here's the awesome God, though. Here's the line of David, the son of Abraham. Boaz, Solomon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. Now, if you don't hear anything else tonight, beloved, I want, I want you to get this. This is so very important as we enter into conversation as, as God begins to bring Jewish believers and Gentile believers together, as we talk about this one new man experience, what is this all about? May I say this to you? Matthew is pointing to the fact, and remember this is a Hebrew audience he's writing to. Matthew is pointing to the fact that God's kingdom does not come solely through a natural race as of a pure bloodline, but a people who are receivers of grace. 
Mark shared this morning, God said, I didn't choose you because you're the most numerous, you were the most favored, and so I chose you, come on, and set my love upon you, amen? That we are recipients of grace, and that we are not to be arrogant as Gentile believers to think somehow we got here on our own, but that Israel is the tree, come on now, and the trunk of the tree, and even if we say partial hardening, as Paul says in Romans, took place, Partial unbelief, but God has not hardened them entirely. For God says in Jeremiah chapter 30 and 31, thereabout, he says, if I break faith with the sun, moon, and stars, I will break covenant with Israel. He's not going to do it. Aren't you glad? And even that new covenant that you got into was actually their covenant. For God said to them, Israel, I will make with you a new covenant. And I will take away the stony heart. I will give you a heart of flesh. I won't write it any longer on tablets merely of stone saying keep these laws, but I will put my laws within you and I will move you by my spirit to keep my laws and decrees. Look at somebody and say awesome God. And this is the God that we have to do. And so when we enter into these conversations in this hour, we must do so, I believe, with great humility. Let me wrap it up with this. Uh, much more I could say. Let me close with the prophet Hosea's words here. Hosea chapter 2. Listen to the word of the Lord. I will take you to, me, to be my wife in faithfulness. This is the Lord speaking to his people. You know, Hosea uh, acted out prophetically. He married Gomer, Gomer who had been unfaithful and, 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 and uh, Hosea was a projection of God's heart for his people, Israel, who had gone astray and weren't following him. But I want you to know time and time again, even though God used the language of fornication and, and adultery and idolatry, uh, uh, imagery, language to describe her unfaithfulness, he said, how can I give you up? I'll not give you up. And so God's promise here to Israel in Hosea 2 I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness, and you will know Yahweh. I will sow her in the land for myself, and I will have compassion on those who have been called no compassion. I will say to those who are not my people, isn't that what has happened with replacement theology? They have said, no, they are no longer a people, they're, that God has no compassion on them. And here's the words of Hosea. Hosea say, saying uh, by the word of Yahweh, by the word of the Lord, I will say to those, I will take her to the land for myself and I will have compassion on those who said there is no compassion. I will, and I will, on those who have been said, not my people, you are my people. And they will declare on that day, you are my God. Hmm? We're in a time, beloved, where we're eyewitnesses. The Bible's the news ahead of the news. Come on now, the Bible sheds a lot of light on commentaries. What's happening in the land is what God said it happened in the land. I will first gather them to myself in the land from the nation, and then I will reveal myself to them in the land. A two-part process. And we've never seen in the history of, of, of in, in human history, from the scattering time and them becoming a nation and all that, I don't have time to go into that. We've never seen a time where more of the Jewish people are making Aliyah and more people are making uh, returning to the land. Come on now. And God says, yep, that's me. But he said, when I bring them into the land, I will reveal myself to them in the land. And do you know how a Jewish mindset understands God revealing himself, making himself known? Through the Torah. And this is the first generation, I was just talking to Pastor uh, Mark and uh, uh, Brother Sam here earlier, it's the first generation, this right now, where right now in the land that the Torah has become now required study in the secular schools of Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're living in awesome times. And so we're called to be, we who have been recipients of grace, we're called to be restorers of hope. And uh, as, as soon as we see uh, uh, people coming together, boy, I could just unpack this. I know we're going to have some time in just a few moments. But let me just say, in this hour, this romance of redemption with Jew and Gentile alike, this is being played out. God will have 
one new man. God is looking for a bride. God has an army in the earth. Come on, that's made of Jew and Gentile alike. Israel and the church is destiny. I want you to hear this, is inseparably intertwined. You cannot say in this moment of history, I'll sit this one out. God didn't give you that option. If you're part of the army, you were drafted. Hallelujah. Come on. Therefore, we the church must stand with Israel in these last days. Even the enemies of God understand, united we stand, divided we fall. Amen? God bless you. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much.